International film is integral to cinema. Let's break down our 10 favorite international films with Marta McFly. Hello, movie friends. Welcome to Raiders of the Lost podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. And today we're doing a very special episode discussing our 10 favorite international films with a very special guest, Marta McFly. Welcome to the show. Hi, guys. How are you? Doing really well. I'm so excited to talk some international film. Your letterbox is just full of so many bangers, and you have an eclectic taste, an excellent taste in international cinema. <laughs> That's why we wanted to invite you on and talk to you about it. Yeah, we we discovered you on TikTok, and we were just drawn to you because you know your stuff, and you talk about the kinds of films that very few people are talking about on TikTok and on social media and on Letterboxd. You're seeing films from all over the world in all sorts of decades and eras, which we think is important. And we try to encourage people as often as we can to watch world cinema and to watch films that have subtitles and to watch films that were made 50 years ago, 80 years ago. It's all incredible stuff. And I think you're doing an amazing job on social media by showcasing the work of filmmakers around the world. So congrats to you. When did you start um, your TikTok? Thank you so much. First off, I just want to say I'm so flattered and so honored that you guys would invite me. Um, yeah, I, I'm so happy to be here. But uh, when did I start my TikTok? I think I started it in 2021. However, I was only posting like once or twice a month. And it's actually after some pushing of some fellow creators like two months ago that I started uploading every single day. So that's kind of it, I guess. You got to go daily. You, that's yep. how we got where we were, six times a day. You got to get those posts up. You gotta. Those are some rookie numbers. I'm glad you got them up. <laughs> Hanging out with yeah. the, yeah, the it's big not, It's not like YouTube. You got to do it daily. <laughs> you got to do YouTube daily too. But you're also <laughs> a, a film journalist as well, right? Yep. So that's my that's my regular job. I freelance write. Um, I'm mainly with Slosh Film right now. Um, Love them. But then I'm also with whoever wants to take me pretty much. So I've written for publications like Little White Lies as well, um, Looper, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Now, international cinema is really important to us and we watch quite a bit. And this episode, we're basically going to each rank our 10 favorites starting from 10 going all the way up to one as well as at the end since it was so hard to narrow this list down we're all going to do our honorable mentions as well we we're all freaking out last night i can't get it down to 10 can we have some extra ones so we're going to do 10 to 1 each one by one we'll discuss each film very briefly and then also those honorable mentions which we got to bring up too but before we get into it marta where can all of our listeners find you uh, okay, so if you want to check out my writing itself, I do have a portfolio. So that's Marta, M-A-R-T-A, D-J-O dot com. Um, that's, yeah, that's my portfolio. And then in terms of social media and videos, TikTok and Instagram is Marta dot McFly. Um, and Letterboxd is Marta McFly, no period. Great name. Awesome stuff. I'm really <laughs> excited about this episode. And also this list is not... The 10 best international films of all time. This is not a best list. This is our individual favorite list. These are the top 10 movies that we enjoy most from independent, from international cinema. I know that the internet right now is flooded with top 10 ranking lists. This is just a personal preference list and what we enjoy watching. We're not saying this is the best international films list. This is just each of our own favorite lists. Yeah, one of mine has quite the body count, not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like an auteur film. <laughs> oh, I'm curious to see that now. I'm yeah, sure it same. is if you picked it. Quite a few bullets get, get sprayed and in it. It was hard. It was hard. It was, I spent like hours yesterday trying to narrow it down to 10. Same. It was tough. I watched you, man. You were sweating all over your <laughs> computer. <laughs> <laughs> How do I do this? I must have Fellini's 8.5 in here somewhere. <laughs> so I got rid of Fellini's 8.5 because there was something else I wanted to put on because I knew that one of you would have it. So I was like, I'm just going to pass this baton. Like I don't know what you're talking about. Who is Felony? Anthony, Anthony's top five is just eight and a half, eight and a half, eight and a half, eight and a half, eight and a half. <laughs> but Dolce Vita. <laughs> no, just all eight and a half. <laughs> I would have the poster up, but I couldn't find it online for the set. <laughs> Anyways. We well, got La Dolce Vita behind you, don't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah you do. Um, it's the only, I it's watched... the only... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh, I was going to say I watched Fellini's Amarcord the other night um, oh, for great. the second time. And it's it's so good. It's still just, I think I enjoyed it even more this time. It's incredible. 
It's uh, it's his most colorful film. Mm -hmm. The color, the costuming, production design, and the makeup and hair is crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good banger. <laughs> Such banger. a banger. It's lit. That's his, movies, <laughs> his movies require rewatches, in my opinion, and they get better every time. I agree. How about we start off with our list? <laughs> Who wants to go first at number 10? I'll go first. All right. Antonio Margariti. <laughs> <laughs> go for it, bro. And also, this is uh, only films not in the English language, I think we all have. Correct? Well, yeah, all international yeah, films. Because for me. no like Irish films, no Scottish films, like not in the English language. So we'll I have a weird that. exception to that, but we can get into it when we do. All right, true. All right, all right, I mean, no technically, worries. like Call Me By Your Name is it's like an international film. It's technically, yeah. but it was also, but it wasn't nominated for Best International. It was nominated for Best Picture. Exactly. That's yeah. why I didn't, I would have included that, but also I figured Anthony's like, no English speaking in these <laughs> movies. If there's any English, it better just be a reference to American culture. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my first pick at uh, number 10 is Park Chan-wook's The Handmaiden. Now, for the longest time, Old Boy was my favorite Park Chan-wook film. And then I had, hadn't heard of The Handmaiden um, until it was really on streaming. and didn't get a big release in America. And then I saw it on Amazon Prime a few years ago. And I was absolutely floored by it. And since then, I've watched it twice. Like I, I've watched it yearly since then. And my God, it is such an incredible film. Uh, it's an incredible screenplay. It's, it's the best writing he's ever done. Uh, I think it's an even better script than Decision to Leave, which I really love. The music, the score, uh, the production design. I love the period setting. It's actually based on an English novel um, by Walsh writer Sarah Waters, but he changed the setting from Victoria-era Britain to Korea under Japanese colonial rule. And the cinematography of this film is really uh, groundbreaking and really remarkable. I find this film to just be highly entertaining, incredible humor, just the characters. There are so many twists in this movie. And what I love about films like this is you have you have no idea where it's going to go. And halfway into this movie, you're like, I have no idea what this, how this is going to end. And that's those are some of the best films where it's so unpredictable and enjoyable, and it's in extremely rewatchable. I love it. Yeah, I think it could be his best movie. It's up. There. It's really mm -hmm. incredible. Such a great production. It blew my hair back when I saw it for the first time too. So excellent pick at number ten. Thanks, man. <laughs> Marta, you want to go next? Yeah. yeah. First off, I just want to say, yeah, that was an incredible pick. It's also my favorite of his. So I'm really happy that you picked it. Um, but for me, I'm gonna go with my ultimate comfort watch, which you guys watched recently, and that is 1985's Tampopo by Uzo Itami. Um, yeah, this is without a doubt just my ultimate comfort movie. If I'm feeling sick and want ramen, watch this movie. Or if you just want ramen, <laughs> watch this movie. Um, <laughs> but it's just such a beautiful look at food and human connection and how these two things interact. Um, it's also called the first Japanese noodle western, which I adore. Um, <laughs> you definitely, there's, an, there's like a cowboy character in it, so that makes sense. Yes. Um, <laughs> But you, so you get the main story of, I guess, well, you guys described it the other day, but I'll do it again. So Tempopo, who runs her noodle shop, it belonged to her late husband. She's not good at making ramen. So after these two truck drivers appear, uh, they teach her the art of noodle soup making. Um, and then within that, we also get these smaller stories throughout with these other characters. And they all revolve around food and just these relationships to food and that's what I love about Itami is so many of his films have that motif of food. Um, either if it's a movie that's really revolving around food, like Tampopo or Supermarket Woman, which I also recommend if you guys haven't seen, but also smaller movies like Minbo, which um, is about the Yakuza, but they still he still makes sure to have certain scenes with this like loving care of plating of the food and everything. It's, it's just beautiful in my opinion. I was so hungry. After watching it, I and, love movies that make me hungry. But I really love the ties to sensuality mm -hmm. and that that carnal desire, and how uh, it's related to food in the film, like the egg yolk scene. I, yep. I was, I that was that I was like, damn, that was hot. I know, me too. I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, oh my god, <laughs> it's like one of the sexiest the scenes I've ever seen. It involves an egg yolk, <laughs> and that's it. it, it it was great, and um, it was and it was just so charming, and I really, really liked it. And then I, I messaged you. I was like, "There's a 22 year old Ken Watanabe in this. What the fuck?" I know. When I saw it for the first time, I was shocked. Um, have you guys seen more of his movies? I mean, he's great. I, it was my first one. My first one. 
So I gotta, yeah, I gotta I, watch the other one you recommended, and then because I really like this one, so I'm gonna watch more of his films. He's great. They're all satires of Japanese culture, um, and it ultimately ended up biting him in the butt. But um, yeah, no, he's he's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Great pick. All right, my turn, number ten. I'm picking a Swedish film, Let the Right One In. This is a vampire film. It was actually remade by Matt Reeves, Mr. The Batman, <laughs> the Planet of the Apes. He remade it called Let Me In for the English language film, but the, the original is a Swedish film based off a Swedish novel of the same name. And it really just tells this remarkably unique vampire story of sort of a coming-age drama of these two young lovers growing up in the same little suburban apartment and when it comes to vampire movies, i never seen anything quite like this before. Just the tone and the style and the character of having the vampire be this young girl who's actually been living for such a long time, has a caretaker who's helping her stay alive, but also trying to find normalcy in her life, trying to connect with a neighbor of hers, this young boy named Oscar, being his kind of protector because he's bullied around school. And it's about their love, really, and about her survival with this curse and I like how it approaches it as a curse. And the remake is actually really phenomenal. It's one of my favorite English-made remakes of all time, for sure. Matt Reeves is a terrific director. But this is one of my favorite vampire movies. I think my two favorite vampire movies are actually international ones. This one and then uh, Thirst, which is a South Korean <laughs> vampire movie made by the GOAT Park Chan-wook. I highly recommend checking that out if you've never seen it before, if you're listening. But Let the Right One In is one of my favorite horror movies. Dark fairy tale. It's excellent. Yeah, and man... The fucking ending, man. So that good. scene. Third act. I remember we watched it when we were like 17, 16. We Same. were, yeah, we were because we were getting into international film, and that's an early one for us where we were like, wow, this is different. Because you grew up, we grew up like watching Blade and movies like that, Lost Boys and stuff. But when you see it like this, and it was a completely different way to tell a vampire story. And then um, I remember I read the novel after watching the film because I liked it so much. But what a phenomenal film! Great pick, man. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great pick. I agree. <laughs> Great pick. It might be the best vampire film ever made. I, th it's I think up there. it could be. Yep. It's up there. All right. Next up, I have one of my favorite directors of all time. I I struggled by only putting one of his movies on because I wanted to put so many. But um, Michael Haneke's The Piano Teacher, which yes. came out in 2001 and stars one of the greatest actors of all time, Isabelle Huppert. And she plays a Vienna, uh, a Vienna conservatory piano teacher who falls into this very strange dominating sexual relationship with one of her students and it's an incredible character piece I think it's one of the greatest character studies uh, put on film and you can compare it to a film like um, you compare it to like something like Travis Bickle on Taxi Driver but I'd never seen a movie like it and um, Haneke I think is one of the greatest filmmakers of all time and if you haven't seen his films he's a filmmaker I would recommend to get on right now um, you might have heard of his movie Funny Games, but he's made a lot of great movies like The White Ribbon and Amor got him a lot of attention in America a few years ago. But The Piano Teacher uh, is just really incredible. It's fascinating. I love the – he has this beautiful contrast between high class um, with depravity. And it's just an amazing contradiction within the character that she's constantly struggling with and trying to balance and trying to hide this sexual depravity that she has within her. But on the exterior, she is a classical piano teacher. So it's a wonderful blending of worlds um, and then eventually colliding. And it's just an incredible film. I couldn't recommend it enough. I have that in my honorable mentions. Nice. I almost <laughs> made my list, but that's an incredible movie. Mm. That ending. I Unfortunately, someone posted like the ending. Really? The, the big that last moment. shot? On Twitter, I saw it, and, and people are like, what is this movie? I'm like, I can't believe someone would post like the biggest moment of the movie on, online it's like that. just for some likes, man. I know, just for that's some neat. engagement. Yeah, I, I, well, it's not like anyone was going to watch it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't going to see Great it. Great pick. <laughs> yeah, I suggest funny games to people sometimes, and they're like, we're not going to watch this. This sounds boring. So, oh, my God. I suggested that to somebody once. Like, why would you suggest that the movie was so fucked up? I'm like, wasn't it great? <laughs> That's the whole point. <laughs> he, and he also directed the American, re the yeah. English-speaking remake of Funny Games, too. Mm -hmm. But the original is <laughs> way better. Yeah, I wonder why he... I don't understand when directors... Uh, remake their own movies but in English. I, I, I don't make I know some George money Sly somehow, Marta. You gotta get paid. 
I think it was uh, kind of. He, he think he did it as an experiment more than anything. Mm, I'm okay. guessing he also wanted to pay for a house or something. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Hollywood money, man. Like, yeah, that, 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 the Austrian film market. It's not that. It's not raking in the dough. What's his name? Who just made the Peter Pan and Wendy movie? Like, um, oh yeah, um, what's, what's his, his name? fucking name? Um, <laughs> I always forget his name. He's great. He, he did, did the Green Knight. Yeah, he did the Green and then Knight. he did. The, you got to pay David the, Lowry. David Lowry. You got to pay oh, the yeah, Lowry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You got to do one for them, one for me. You one know? for Disney, yeah. one for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He <laughs> it's has part of the, the game. weirdest filmography. It's David so Lowry. random. It's so random. I love him. <laughs> Love him. Pete's Dragon, Ain't the Body Safe. Ghost Story. Ghost Story, like, ghost story yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did Pete's Dragon, then a ghost story? What? <laughs> Crazy. All right, Marta, kick us off with number nine. Okay, number nine is a weird one. There's a lot of technicalities here that I'm going to get into, but it is from technically 1988. Um, Andre Zulowski's On the Silver Globe. Have you guys seen it? I have, I have not. not. No. No. It's, it's incredible. So um, it's actually based on a collection of novels that Zulowski's great granduncle wrote in the early 1900s. Um, and it involves a group of cosmic explorers uh, who basically leave Earth and they start a new civilization on another planet. And from there, we get some time jumps, these weird otherworldly creatures, let's call them. Um, and I don't want to spoil anymore, but it's such a vis visual spectacle from the Elaborate costumes, the location shots, it's its just crazy. It's its absolutely bonkers. Um, and this he actually, is the unfinished film? The unfinished yeah. film? That's so, it. Yeah, yeah. So he started filming it in the mid-1970s. Um, under uh, It was funded by the Polish government under the condition that it contains no anti-communist sentiments. And so he completed four-fifths of the movie, and a new vice minister of cultural affairs was elected, and he saw the themes in the movie and he was like, heck no, you're you're not making this. So he ordered everything to be destroyed. And Zulowski, sneaky guy, he goes to France, keeps everything, and then returns to Poland a decade later, finishes the movie, adds voiceover narration to these missing scenes over um, images of like a modern Poland. And he literally says, I blame censorship for this. And with all that being said, it's it's just such a testament to his own ability to make something so good that isn't even fully complete. It's, I think if it was done correctly, it could have been one of the greatest sci-fi movies of all time because as it stands right now, it's still incredible. I, I love this one. I've been meaning to watch this because I, I read the story a couple months ago about this unfinished film and I saw the trailer and I was like, oh shit. I just, um, <laughs> I never got around to it. So now I'm going to make that my next to watch because I found it so curious from the imagery. It was so powerful and, and so yeah. incredible. And the story itself is just great. I, it also has a lot of really good rewatch value, I think. I've seen it twice now. The first time it's a lot to take in. It's a bit confusing. And then the second time you, you just kind of vibe with it more, you know? Gotcha. That's gotcha. really interesting. I want to check that out. I think Jurassic's yeah. Dune that never got made that he wanted to make and yeah. all the concept art for that's really fascinating. I want to check that out. Very cool. You, would you have liked the Dune that I, he would have done? I, I like the art he came up because with. Because James, James, James is very a, far out. James is a huge Dune fan of mm -hmm. the novel. So you, you've seen, you think that, I haven't seen the full documentary about uh, it, but I've seen a bunch of clips in concept art and it was definitely a unique vision. Uh -huh. But I think what Denis pulled off is like, such a good adaptation, the perfect version. but like you could, yeah. but like he, that goes hand in hand so much with Patrice Vermette and who is Denis Villeneuve's production designer and the the world they build, the worlds they build together with Blade Runner, especially in Arrival, kind mm -hmm. of the same concepts of art in the background, and everything and, and architecture. So every filmmaker is different. Everyone's approach would have been different to Dune, but it looks far out. It looks mm -hmm. like a trippy movie. I would have liked to see it for sure. Me too. Yeah. All right, my number nine is the uh, body count one for me over here. This is going to be The Raid Redemption. Oh, yeah. This came out in 2011, directed by Gareth Evans, actually. And it's about a SWAT team that and corruption as well that are taking down a building full of criminals that's run by a local crime boss gangster. And on, under the guise of, you know, we're trying to clean up the streets – as well as the main character, his brother's in there, he's trying to get out as well, who's working with the gangsters. And 
it's probably the best martial arts film I've ever seen in my entire life. I don't, every time I watch this film, I, I don't understand how they were able to film the sequences they filmed. The long takes, the incredible practical effects, the camera movements. They are literally taking the camera and going through windows. They're falling down floors of, of the building with the camera. They're going through holes in the floor. The martial arts is absolutely sensational. And these, these stunt guys and these martial artists and these actors are so talented and in Indonesia, it's such a such a booming part of the film industry there, and I think they really got to showcase what they're capable of in that country with their film industry when it comes to martial arts films and great filmmaking. And they really like when it comes to a crew and a production giving a movie everything they have. Few movies really showcase the effort that went into a movie, especially something like this, made on a really tight budget because you can film very cheaply out there, but what a phenomenal movie. The story, the concept, and the characters are all really solid as well. It's nothing you've never really seen before, and the Dread movie is kind of similar in a lot of ways, but this uh, movie, very- <laughs> it blows my hair back every time. It's brutal. It's hardcore. There's a great emotional core to it with family as well as political corruption and police corruption is involved as well, and it's it's gnarly. It's just beauty, beautiful gore, and I absolutely love every second yeah. of it. All of your favorite modern action combat movies were heavily influenced by the raid redemption as well as other movies from the past but the raid of redemption specifically in terms of its use of long takes and the camera utilizing small cameras they can move around sets and environments and through walls and in the in number two they they're moving the camera through gar- cars and vehicles and stuff and like extraction two and extraction one people are always talking about the oh my god the new long take but like it really owes a lot and pays tribute to what they did in the Raid Redemption. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Great pick, because that's always such a fun watch. It really I is. I love that I, one. <laughs> I chose a very unfun watch for my next one. But uh, it's really incredible. And I found it, made, it was very influential for me when I was a, a teenager. It's the Romanian film Four Months, Three Weeks, Two Days, uh, written and directed by Christian Munju. It's, it's the I think, the greatest film to depict the, the topic of abortion. And it's set in communist Romania during the final years of the Kashiku era. And it tells the story of two students in, in university, their roommates, and one is trying to pro- procure an illegal abortion for her friend. Um, and it was they were putting themselves at risk to try and make this happen. And the film follows their exploit of trying to get this illegal abortion. Um, I don't want to spoil anything because it's a really powerful film. Uh, but the way that he, he shoots is... Very much reminiscent of the Dardenne brothers, who are a couple of my favorite directors, where very long takes, handheld, very minimalist, and it's it brings you into the reality of the space, and it makes you really feel like you're being inserted into the world that they've crafted. Um, and it's just an extremely difficult watch, but also an important one. Um, but I watch it because it's, it's acted so well, it's directed so well, the cinematography I love, um, but it's still a very timely and relevant film. Um, and, and he's made a couple of other great films like Beyond the Hills, which I really like. But um, this one is when I watch it, I'm always just absolutely floored by it. And it's just a masterpiece and a masterwork of filmmaking. Wow. I haven't seen this one. I'm I'm going to check this out. This sounds really interesting. Yeah, he showed, Anthony showed me it when we were like 15. <laughs> no, no, we're 17. 17-ish, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony in his, in his movie dungeon, he showed me it. <laughs> It was one of the first French movies. I mean, uh, not French. Uh, Romanian. R- one of the Romanian. first international. One of the first like international movies I ever seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I was, I was... What a start! <laughs> I know, right? I was, I was traumatized. Off with the bang! I was like, I'm never watching a movie again. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. It's highly relatable, and it's still relevant today. Yeah, I'm gonna definitely check that one out. Is it me? It sure it's is. Me. It, it's me. It's me. Okay. Your time has come. My time is gone. Uh, so I flip flopped with my number eight pick, but I decided to go with Argento's Suspiria because it's the first movie that got me into Italian horror. So I gotta, I gotta pay, pay my dues and my respects. Um, I actually had a chance to watch it in theaters a few years back, and that was just the best experience. All those colors, um, that score the Goblin by score. Goblin. Yeah, it's it's All wild. The reds, um, yeah. But I mean, I know a lot of people have seen it, so I'll just quickly describe it, I guess. But our lead, Susie, goes to a dance academy or arrives to one in Germany, um, and she notices some creepy things going on. Um, and I don't want to say more, because for anybody that hasn't seen it, I think 
that's where I should stop talking and people should go into it blind. Um, but yeah, I, I love the vibes of this one. It's definitely a movie that focuses, in my opinion, on atmosphere and disorienting the viewer over an easy to follow narrative story. Um, and, and I'm fine with that. I think that's so much fun. And the colors as well, like I said, are so vivid. Um, and I was reading somewhere that Argento actually modeled um, all those red colors off of the red apple from Disney's Snow White. Wow, um, interesting. And I think that's absolutely spot on to to the apple from Snow White. I love that. Mm -hmm. Hence, you you said there's English in one of your picks. <laughs> oh crap! It's this one too. That's the oh, one. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen? Have uh, no, it gets a pass though. No, oh, no worries. Yeah, yeah, she goes it's there. It's an yeah, Italian film. There, yeah. It's an Italian film. Have you seen uh, Luca Guadagnino's remake? I did. I loved it. I absolutely yeah. adored it. However, I struggle comparing the two because I think they're so different. Yeah, um, that's why it's a good so remake. Yeah. Absolutely, and I, yeah, I, I think it's good that it was so different because why would you want the exact same thing, right? So, mm. until but the I, I are love amazing. it. Mm -hmm. And the score for that was good too. It was uh, Tom York, wasn't it? Yeah, Tom York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent pick. All right, my number Thank eight. You. Mine's probably the most controversial. I'm guessing on either of our lists. Ooh, In controversial. My, I haven't seen everyone else's list, Ooh. but this is a controversial movie, and it's also a tough watch. You know, this uh -huh. one I saw for the first time this year at the New Beverly Cinema on film. Oh, it just my blew my mind. Blew my mind. I'm still thinking about it. Like two months later, and it's a uh, Gaspar Noe's Irreversible came out in 2002, and it just tells the story of this one brutal night for these characters, but in reverse chronological order. And just the structure of the filmmaking is astounding. And basically, the, what he does is chronologically, you're seeing the last scene first, and then he goes. The next scene you'll see is the scene that's before that, but he also starts every scene from the beginning. So it's kind of like going backwards, like reading a book or going backwards, watching a movie. But you you know the outcome of the end of the previous scene. And when you're watching the the next scene, which was the previous moment chronologically, you're going to try to figure find out how they got to that moment later on. It's just a really remarkable way to write and tell a story, not to mention the the creativity with the camera that just seems to be moving like a ghost throughout the entire story, just like a voyeur just joining these characters on this insane journey. There are some really tough to watch moments and it stars Vincent Castle and Monica Bellucci, both give incredible performances. It's jarring at times and it's a difficult film to watch. I recommend not taking a girl to see this movie. <laughs> um, it's, <laughs> but it is still astounding filmmaking, no matter how controversial it is. I just, I was floored by it. I, I hadn't felt that way about a movie in a long time and, and what it did to me but it, I think it's just remarkable filmmaking and it's so tragic and it gets even more and more tragic as the story progresses to the point where you're at the beginning of the day by the end of the film so the movie starts at the end of the at the end of the night and the movie ends at the beginning of the day and you see the outcome of these characters that you grow to eventually really care about and what happens to them over the course of this wild horrific night and it's just shocking and it's such a well-made movie it blew my hair back and i think there was the it really works the reverse chronology because it all sets up to the horribly tragic simplicity of the final moments of the movie which like you said is the start of the day you just how simple and innocent that is because you already know what happens next and i think that that's what the that's the whole point of the movie yeah it's a tough one. It's tough watch. It's horrible, yeah. Great, it's pick, great pick. It's a great mm -hmm. pick. I agree. I also watch. really like um, <laughs> Climax by him, too, which is Climax equally is as stressful. Maybe even more stressful, actually, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> we just did that for our Patreon. It was great. I love that movie. Which one? Climax? Yeah, Climax. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Have you what seen Love? People on. Have you seen Love? Uh, yeah, so I... Um, and in the very unpopular camp of actually kind of enjoying love. I love um, love. I think it's oh, great. Oh, wow. Yeah. I guess I think we're the fantastic. only ones. 
because every like all my letterboxed mutuals have it at like one star or like two stars. Well, they can't I, handle fucking sex in movies, even though it's like he's a he's a very divisive filmmaker. Yeah. Even like Edge yeah. of the Void, where all of his films are divisive, as well as there's like a conformity of n you're not supposed to like his movies or respond <laughs> positively. To like them. he's a problem. Yeah, yeah. It's like <laughs> I just the movie I picked. It's like some people wouldn't even want to put that in the, one of their favorite international films to say that they actually liked that movie, which means like, am I signing off on the things that happen in the movie? Absolutely not. It's just an incredible mm -hmm. movie. I agree. Yeah, we live in a weird society nowadays. We're obsessed with sex, and yet we act like sex is something that should be a problem on no, screen. You can't see it anymore. Yeah, you can't <laughs> Not see in Hollywood. it anymore. No more sex. But I think Love was great. It, it actually showed real sex between the, yeah. the actors really happening. Like you see, <laughs> it's it's awesome, I think. It's great. <laughs> yeah, we know why Anthony likes it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just kidding. It's, just, no, it's, kidding. Kidding. it's, a part, it's, a, it's as much a part of our lives as eating breakfast. It is. And, but we like That's to true. act like when we watch a movie, it doesn't exist. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Unless it's like fucking fantasized and romanticized. Yeah. You know what I mean? That right. was my first movie of his I watched, weirdly really? enough. Really? Wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> the first one I saw was, um the what's the fucking POV one called? The crazy, the crazy POV one. Climax, um, no, or no? No, no, the point of point of view one. Oh, what's it called? I'm, I feel I'm. Hold on. This is gonna bother me now too. It's the. Uh, Vortex. Uh, Enter the void. Enter, Enter the, the void. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah That's yeah, the yeah. first one I saw him, yeah. and I was like, "What?" The? There was like an early Netflix movie they had on streaming, and um, it was one of the. I remember watching it years ago, and I was like, well, "This is unbelievable! It's all POV." Just of the character, and, and I won't spoil it, but he like dies, and you're just like, uh, I won't spoil, spoil it, but <laughs> this is set up. This is it's in the trailer. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, Everything moving on. The trailer these days. <laughs> yeah, number for real. seven. Yeah. <laughs> if, you watch a, if you watch a Disney movie trailer, you already watched the movie. <laughs> anyway, my next pick at number seven. S seven. Mm -hmm. So it's a genre that is become very popular and it's been used and copied and done over and over and over again but I think this is like the epitome of the kidnapping movie a uh, movie about kidnapping it's high and low Akira Kurosawa's <laughs> unbelievable film uh, I had seen most of his samurai films before I even saw high and low and I watched high and low for the first time and I was it was over and I was like that's one of the greatest films I've ever fucking seen in my life and it's the writing, it's the directing. Um, Kurosawa is an amazing director and blocker, like Spielberg. And Spielberg actually drew heavily from him as being a fan of his, of being able to move the camera, do these incredible intricate long takes that are kind of creating separate shots on their own. But the writing of this is really incredible. It's one of the best scripts of all time. Um, and it's just beautifully acted by the cast. And it's one of those just... It's one of the most fascinating investigative films of all time. It, it might be my favorite just investigative film I've, I've ever seen. And it's just a remarkable film, a beautiful piece of filmmaking. And for someone who every, when people generally think of Kurosawa, they think of Samurai. Um, but I think this is, it could possibly be his greatest film. And I just found it just, it's just endlessly rewatchable and so suspenseful and thrilling. Um, it's an all-timer. Yeah, I watched this for the first time this year too. It almost made my list. And mm -hmm. he's a he's a genius filmmaker, one of the best of all time. And also, Toshiro Mifune always gets left out of <laughs> yes. greatest actor of all time. List. He's amazing. He's such a yes. good actor, yes. and he's so incredible to watch. That whenever I watch a Kurosawa movies or whenever I watch a movie with him, I'm like drawn to him versus the subtitles. He's always a scene <laughs> so I'm like watching him. I'm like, oh, wait, what, what, what did they just say? Because I'm so. <laughs> enthralled by his performances he's such a terrific actor and yeah. he's, he's so good in that movie he's one too. of the greatest actors to ever live yeah without a doubt really? that's, i'm really glad you said that that's a great thing to say mm -hmm. thanks, man. thanks man you know your stuff <laughs> <laughs> watch out Marta. this guy he knows his this stuff. guy <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen a couple movies guys <laughs> a few things a few things <laughs> all right Marta, what do you got for number seven uh number seven also i do want to say high and low would have made my top 20 so i agree nice. that's Perfect. a good call um, but my number seven, this was really hard. So when I started watching international films, um, I started watching French films and the French New Wave movement was huge for me. Um, and my favorite director of that movement has changed throughout the years and now it's Eric Romer. Um, and I'm the biggest Romer fangirl romance. until I die. Sorry? He does a lot of romance, doesn't he? 
He does. He does a lot yeah. of romance. Um, I also think he served as inspiration, or at least one of the inspirations for Mumblecore films. So stuff by Richard Linklater. He's even said he's been inspired by Romer. Uh, Noah Baumbach as well. Um, and his movies aren't for everyone. They're very, very chatty. I think Gene Hackman once said that he watched a Romer film and it felt like watching paint dry. Um, <laughs> I'm not really selling it right now. <laughs> no, but he, Gene Hackman, he, he's a very... His, he's a very opinionated guy, he was. Rumpy guy. Um, yeah. he, did, but, he hated Wes Anderson. Oh, no, I had no he idea. Hated, he hated the Royal Tenenbaums. What? Yeah. Well, that's a bummer. Oh, so, yeah, anyways, so don't listen um, to Gene Hackman. <laughs> enough of Gene Hackman. Um, but yeah, if you love dialogue and movies that are uh, conversation heavy, he's that guy. So I'm going to go with 1986's, which is admittedly after the French New Wave yeah. movement. But anyways, I digress. Um, the Green Ray. <laughs> which I really do think, again, served as some inspiration for the Before trilogy. And I usually refer to it as the single person's Before Sunrise. Um, and it revolves around our lead. Uh, her name is Delphine. She's been broken up with and she's all alone on her summer vacations. And she's super anxious and lonely. And she pretty much floats from her friend's various summer homes, which, by the way, I wish I had a lot of friends with summer homes in France, but anyways, <laughs> um, she nice. has all these surface level conversations with everyone and they make her feel even more lonely. Um, and it's just overall just this beautiful portrait of loneliness and depression and has a payoff at the end that's just immaculate in my opinion. Um, and Romer was a writer as well. He was a writer before he became a filmmaker. So I think he's produced some of the finest dialogue on film, truly. And it really does feel like you're a fly on the wall. I haven't seen that. I'm going to add it to my list. Mm -hmm. I think you'd really like it. I was actually rewatching um, The Worst Person in the World the other day, and there were some shots that really reminded me of the Green Ray, even just briefly. Yeah. I feel like I'm a, a passenger in my own life. <laughs> Is that what she says? Yeah, she says yeah, that. That's yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I dev yeah, highly recommend. Definitely suggest you guys uh, see the Green Ray as well. Adding it to the list. All right, my number seven. Mine is going to be Rosetta. Now, this is a Luc Dardenne and Jean-Pierre Dardenne film, Belgium filmmakers that were huge fans of. Anthony got me into them back in our teen years. And Rosetta, it really... I, I think the, Dar the Dardennes are probably the best filmmakers in the world at capturing life, capturing reality. Because this film, like many other films, they focus on one particular subject, usually a person or a couple people. And kind of like a day in the life or, or what their lives are like. And oftentimes very unglamorous, working class, lower class people. And, and how tough life is because for most people, life is a struggle, a day-to-day -day life. And Rosetta is about this young woman who her life is a complete struggle, has been a struggle her whole entire existence. Whether it's her family with her mother, trying to hold a job. All she wants to do is try to hold down a job, try to get a job. And she'll do anything she can to get a job as simple as something as making waffles in a little waffle stand. And she'll do anything to keep that job. And it's heartbreaking. It's tragic. It's so realistic to reality and the authenticity of our day-to-day -day lives. And stories like this don't really get told very often in America and in Hollywood filmmaking. But I think it's important because it's more relatable than a superhero to see what someone goes through just to try to feed themselves every day and try to make enough money to pay rent at their trailer that they live in. And it, it's heartbreaking, beautiful, so well acted. The, the filmmaking's sen sensational, mostly handheld, pretty much all handheld, patient filmmaking. And you just feel like you're following a real person. And I think that's why they're such a genius filmmakers. And of all their films, I think this one I connect with the most for sure. Yeah, it was their big one. This mm -hmm. one blew them up. It was their first one to play at Cannes. Um, oh, no, the second one, sorry. No, it's the third one. What am I thinking? <laughs> no, no, it was no, the second the, one. It's the fifth one. No, 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 no. <laughs> I actually chose their another Dardenne's film for my number six pick. Well, let's let's segue into it then. This is a great segue. I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even plan that. The Dardenne bros with the Devony bros. <laughs> the Devony bros with the Dardenne bros. I chose L'Enfant, The Sun. Uh, mm -hmm. This is an incredible film. It was the... Uh, we grew up actually watching... Um, international films here and there because we were we actually were big fans of Jackie Chan and Jet Li, so we were yeah. watch the, we were watch their war epics, their um, action epics mm -hmm. made in China. Um, so we actually those were the international films we would watch growing up. 
But it wasn't until I saw L'Enfant and a few other um, filmmakers. I took like a French film class, so I was obviously a new wave. And then mm. what, what the Dardens were doing in Belgium. And then I saw L'Enfant, and I had never seen a movie like it. It's a, it's a, it tackles a lot of the same themes that Jimmy just mentioned. They always go with lower class, um, impoverished people, people who are struggling. Um, but in this case, it's about this young couple who are living on welfare, and the boyfriend is a petty criminal, and he cut. And they recently had a baby, and he comes up with this idea of selling the baby just for petty cash, and that's the the catalyst of the film. And then what happens after, uh, it's just unbelievable. It's it's the greatest conflict they've come up with in a film, and they they have like the thing with their films is it's very minimalist. They're very simple stories, but the conflicts that end up happening in their films are so high for just that person's life. It's not a sky beam in the middle of a city. It's not like an end of the world device. It's just really like the worst thing that could happen to one person. And that's what's really strong about their films. And like you said, Hollywood doesn't really make movies like this anymore. They they generally used to, but they're kind of going towards just only strictly fantasy and escapism. Whereas mm-hmm. a film like this and what the Dardens are so great at doing is just showing you human beings and uh, allows you to empathize with other cultures. They have, they just did um, a film recently about a, a Middle Eastern kid growing up in Belgium and then uh, an African immigrant in, in Belgium. So they're tackling subjects that other filmmakers don't, but that are still very important to the world. And I find Len Font to be so rewatchable. And what they do is they they beautifully portray life and like how people really interact and how dialogue really is spoken, how we really um, connect with one another in a beautiful way. Um, I, I love all their movies, but Len Font is the big one for me. I haven't seen that. I, I really want to. I'm going to add that to my list as well, I guess. We, we're doing, giving all each other homework today. All right. I yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Got to reconvene in a week and see what, what we've done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Marta, number six, what do you got? Number six, it is, um, in my opinion, the greatest ode to cinema, and that is Giuseppe Tornatore's Cinema Paradiso from 1988. Um, I love this movie. It's so nostalgic. It's timeless. It's I, it's just always going to be relevant. And I mean, that score as well. It's Morricone, right? Yeah, Morricone mm-hmm. score. Is incredible. He to me with as well with uh, Nino Rota are like two of my favorite um, composers. So yeah, cinema cinema parody. So is great. Um, I guess I can explain the plot a little, um, yeah. even though I'm sure you guys know it. <laughs> I almost I almost put it in my list. Uh, did you? Oh, it's nice. in my honor. It's in my honorable mentions. Yeah. Nice. Um, but yeah, so we basically follow the life of a uh, successful filmmaker, and we travel back in time to his youth. Um, to see how he discovered his own love of film through the local projectionist that works at his theater. Um, And it's just very honest. It's a great coming of age story. It's also heartbreaking, never ceases to make me sob. Uh, It's just immaculate in my opinion. And I think it won an Oscar for best uh, foreign language film. Yeah, it did. Yeah. It's amazing. It's for anyone who loves film. It's, it's the, I think it's the ultimate film that is like about the love of film. Absolutely. The, the yeah. Fablemans is like that too. Yeah. Like I felt that when I watched the Fablemans this year. I love films about filmmaking and then mm-hmm. also Hugo is very much like that as well. So I Absolutely. think it's a really special yeah. movie. That right, scene my, of him yeah. in the uh, movie theater just crushes me. My yeah. God. It's a really powerful movie and it's just, it's an epic, you know, it's, it's yeah. just, you see every part of this kid's life to be him being a successful director to him being a little kid. Yeah. Have you Let's guys move. seen, um, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. We can move on. Yeah. Yeah. I was just gonna say, have you guys seen like both versions? Because there's the longer one and the shorter one. I have not seen both versions. I, no. I I I didn't know there were two versions. I don't know which one I've seen and which one I haven't seen. I, I prefer the longer one personally, but I usually do if there's like a director's mm. cut and mm-hmm. a shorter I like one. That. I like that director's cut <laughs> with the fingers, <laughs> and the scissor fingers. I'm All a right, hand my... talker. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. You're good. My number six is in the mood for love. This is a Wong Kar Wai film, and <laughs> what? Uh, you'll you'll laugh after. What, is it your I have a Wong Kar Wai movie. Wow, we're going back to back. Ne- yeah. Me too. Wong Kar Wai. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is an absolutely sensationally beautiful film. It's tragic. It's about romance. It's about love. It's about these two, this man and this woman who live in the same hall together, basically same apartment area. 
their neighbors, and they find out that their lovers are having an affair, and they're off in a different country having this affair. And so basically they're kind of – they make this deal to replicate the – presence of the other significant other without intimacy that's the rule they don't have any intimate interactions at all although the tension building you want it to happen so much and i won't spoil if it does or not but they basically take on the roles of the other person that's missing from their lives and it's so well acted and written and and the filmmaking sensational the colors are terrific the use of green and red are, are so you know visceral and important to the movie and the themes of the film but it's just really also about, you know, what could have happened if I met this person at a different point in my life or, you know, if I met them again later on in my life and, and, and just kind of the the concept of not just lost love and love, but determinism and fate and how that ties into everybody's life, whether it's existence, whether it exists or not. Mm-hmm. And does true love exist? Do soulmates exist? And, you know, if you love... Even like a movie like Parasite, the filmmaking is just so reminiscent of this with the slow motion sequences, which I think are just sensational with the orchestral with the orchestral music. And I, I love this movie, and I see something new every time I watch it. And, and yeah, great it's movie. dreamy. It it's makes dreamy. me want to find my long lost love in the alleyway of a noodle sh- of a noodle stand. <laughs> basically, <laughs> basically, and they dress so well in this movie too. Oh yeah, oh it's so God. stylish. It's dress so, so stylish. well. So I have. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> No, no, go ahead. I, I, I have him on my list later, so we can get yeah, back. So do, so do I. I actually have him next. So just how you did a Dardenne's and I did a Dardenne's. <laughs> you did a Wong Kar Wai and I have Wong Kar Wai for my next one. But my number five is Chungking Express. Yes. Um, because as much as I love In, in the Mood for Love and it, it made it onto my uh, honorable mentions. Because it's a better movie and it's just an unbelievable um, display of filmmaking. But Chungking Express is so fucking rewatchable. It's so fun, and Fei Fei Wong is the most charming, delightful actor I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. And this is a movie that when I watch it, I'm just smiling half the time, and just having a lot of fun. Um, and it's it's it tackles some similar themes about lost love, and um, this is about two. This is basically two stories. Um, uh, but I li- I always prefer the second story because it it's just. I think it's because of her and Tony Lung. They have great chemistry, mm-hmm. and the just the, the food shop stand, and it's just un- the unspoken desires people have for one another. It's just on display in this film in an amazing way, and it's just so fucking goddamn charming and delightful. Um, I couldn't recommend it enough. California dream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if you haven't seen Chunking Express. And you want to mm. get into Wong Kar Wai, it's definitely a good one to start off with. That's funny because we saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood yeah. at the New Beverly, and that also has California You're Dreaming right, it in does, it, but yeah. a different version, mm. different uh, yeah. a cover of it. But yeah, that's one of my favorite parts of the film as well. He always has the best soundtracks, eh? In every mm. single one of his movies. Yep. It's wild. Love it. All right. So, what do you have for number five? Number five. So this is a big deal. Um, because it's a recent watch and it knocked off Rashomon off my list. And oh. yeah, yeah, and it's your doing. It's uh, 1962's <laughs> Harakiri. Yes, yes. Um, this was, I just, I am so blown away by this movie. I can't put into words. I, I just feel like an idiot for putting it off for so long because it's one of those movies that was on my watch list for years and I was just like, eh, I watched so Everybody many. Everybody says to watch it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I watched yeah. so many samurai movies. Forget it, forget it, forget it. Um, but that's a good thing that I watched so many samurai movies because what I noticed with this and why it stuck out to me so much is because it does something different and it paints the samurai code as a flawed one, which I think is really, really a cool approach to take. And it's done through the story, obviously, but through visual cues as well. So the movie opens and closes with this empty suit of armor. um, And that to me, I mean, I could be wrong, but that to me signifies, obviously, this is an honorable, honorable job, job, I guess, or life to lead. But at the same time, the suit of armor is empty, which can also signify how empty this life is too, emotionally as well. Um, So I just think there's a lot to pick up on with this movie. I've only seen it once. I gotta watch it again. Um, but I, I loved but it. But it's so and- fucking goddamn good. You're like, I gotta put it on this list. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And also that final action sequence in the end. Yes. Yes. What? Sick. Oh my god. 
It's yeah, I'm, it's you're better than waiting a, for it to happen. It's better yeah. than most action sequences ever made. We showed that Absolutely. to our Discord yeah, as a watch we, party. Yeah, we did a watch party year. and showed it to our our Discorders and they loved it. It's so cool. It has so much. I mean, it has those flashback sequences that I mean, we also get from a Kurosawa movie. It has the action as well, but then yeah, like I said, I, I really love the sort of thematic elements of this one. I just think it's so different for its time compared to everything else that was coming out um, out of Japan. It's a great pick. All right. My number five is, is it my first French film on my list so far? Yeah. I'm going to France, and <laughs> it won't be the last time. Amelie, I yeah. adore this movie. It is just a fairy tale. And I have so much fun watching every time uh, it's directed by Jean-Pierre Junet and actually stars uh, the director of La N as well, who's in this movie. But um, I think Amelie is just a really special movie. It's it's just so comical and surreal at the same time as just a love. I love a good love story, but also there's really nothing like this. There's nothing like this, I think, in the romance genre. It's so unique. And just this quality of just... Just this fanciful story about this character, and Amelie is so charismatic and likable, and I love her character design. She's almost just like, just sort of like a cartoon character, the way that she's depicted in terms of her look and her aesthetic. And, and Audrey Tattoo is great. Yeah, Audrey Tattoo is phenomenal, and this was just a star-making role for her. She was just perfectly cast, and I really adore this movie, and you know, she's on this quest to just spread love and spread joy as well as falling in love at the same time and it kills me every time because of how much I love it and I, I adore it. Next, you should watch You should watch uh, Delicatessen. I shall. You, you, I think you really like it. I, will, I think I you'd really watch like Delicatessen. It. It's a, it's a dark, dark, gory, <laughs> same kind of tone, though. It's very fun. <laughs> Great pick. Great pick. So, so Are you creativity. able yeah. to uh, eat um, creme brulee without smacking it? I, know, I don't think I've ever I... tried it like that before. <laughs> <laughs> ever since I saw her do it, now whenever I order creme brulee anywhere, I just go whack, 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 whack. whack. <laughs> so I've, never, I've never had real creme brulee. I don't what? Think. I've had... Well, no, I think I had a little one once, like in a little... Yeah, I've, like had, a little... I've had a little one. Yeah, a little one. We're from yeah, Boston, had, you know. We don't we, we eat creme brulee. We eat donuts, <laughs> not creme brulee. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've been to Europe, bro. We've yeah, been yeah, to yeah. Europe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. I have a film that came out not too recently, but I think it's just already one of the greatest films I've ever seen. I've seen it five times now, so it's not like I ran out of the theater and said, "All time." Best movie ever, <laughs> greatest thing ever existed. You know, I I like to give movies time and rewatches. It's funny how often that happens. Every month yeah, I see that it's it's something's best the best movie ever. Movie. Yeah, <laughs> I, but I think it's important if you're really gonna say that to be sure about it. And so <laughs> I like to I like to give movies time and let them sit with me. Now, I, when I first saw Parasite, is my movie number four. Yes. I, I I was absolutely floored by it, and I just remember sitting. I was I was at the I saw it at the Los Feliz Theater, and the credits were rolling, and I was just sitting there just like. That I was, it was just like a out of body experience, you know what I mean? And I was like, I was like, I sat there and I was like, it was perfect. I was, it was a perfect movie. And then I, I immediately got home and I was like, you gotta see Parasite. This was before it yeah. was going word of mouth explosion. Yeah, yeah. it was on it its first weekend of release. It was a very limited release. It was like only playing in like two theaters in LA. And I saw it like two days later. I'm like, oh my yeah. god, dude! <laughs> but I was just absolutely floored. And then I watched it again. And then I've seen it three times since. And my God, it really is uh, of this century. It could be the greatest film of the century, but it, it is an all-time film. Um, Bong Joon Ho, I had actually been a longtime fan of his because uh, the first one, of the, an early international film I saw in theaters was The Host, mm -hmm. which came like 2016, 2017. That came out, and I was I no, it was, was Parasite came out. In oh, I'm sorry, 2006. Yeah, two, yeah, yeah. I'm older than I'm thinking I am because Parasite was 2019. <laughs> no, no, yeah, no, no. I yeah. I was thinking 2006, yeah, yeah. but I was just. I'm it's old. okay, man. I'm old. He doesn't know his dates. <laughs> um, I was 16, 17 is what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> and I remember seeing that, and I was just absolutely blown away. I've never seen a monster movie like that. And I was like, what is this movie? And who is this director? And then I watched um, the other films he had made, like Memories of Murder. And then whenever he came out with a new movie, I was uh, I was really excited to see it, like Snowpiercer <laughs> and a couple of his others. And then, so when Parasite was coming out, I was like already juiced about it. And my expectations were high, but somehow Bong Joon-ho 
crushed my expectations and honestly blew all of his other movies out of the water as incredible as, as they are because he made a he made a generational film with this I think and it really is an absolute fucking mo- monster of filmmaking and it's one of the best screenplays ever written I would say um, and the the cast is so good this film not sh- I, I'm so happy that Bong Joon Ho cleaned up shop at the Oscars but the cast should have been nominated as well. Mm-hmm. Um, they did win the SAG award for ensemble cast, but the fact that this didn't get Oscars for lead actor and supporting actress is ridiculous. Um, not even nominations for anyone. So, um, but it really is extraordinarily acted by the entire cast. This is an amazing ensemble, but I love the film, and I it's what it's become one of my favorite movies to watch. Mm-hmm. Excellent pick, man. I think Squid Game's really do- been the the film or TV show that's kind of introduced the Oscars to nominating or award shows nominating international actors because that they got Golden Globe nominations should have been Parasite. <laughs> yeah, no, I I love Parasite as well. I um I was in Mexico last month and I didn't have subtitles and I watched the whole thing in Spanish and <laughs> still loved it. Like it was still just incredible. So yeah, I think that was my third time watching it too. So yeah, huge huge fan. <laughs> Hey, some of those European countries dubbing is uh, art form. Take they do they do a very Take good seriously. job with dubbing. Spain and Italy um, do a really good job with their dubs. All right, Marta, <laughs> what do you got for number four? Uh, number four, two thousand and one's "Y tu mamá también" by Mr. Alfonso Cuarón. Um, from did I say from two thousand and one? Yes, I did. Uh, it's my favorite road trip movie. I love it as a coming of age movie. It touches upon so many themes while still being visually a stunning film that just brings me to tears. I I love this. Um, We watched two teenage boys uh, pretty much convince an older woman to go on a road trip to a secluded beach, which doesn't exist, (laughs) um, (laughs) as a means to woo her. And so they go off. Uh, And it's a movie about, you know, friendship and love. I also like that he touches on classism, which he does more so in Roma, but it's still very relevant here. Um, And Cuaron has even said that all of his movies revolve around a theme of solitude. And I think if you really analyze this one, you can see that theme running through Itumama as well. Um, It's just such a stunning movie. It always just injects me with so much life and reminds me that things are fleeting. So, you know, live in the moment. So funny too. It's a great pick. It's so funny. Mm-hmm. I have it on my list, so I'll talk about it in a little bit. I love how the boys they think like they're like pros in, in the bed in bed and then they, they each get their turn with her and they last two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's also just such I mean, I, I know online a lot of people are like, This is such a horny movie and I'm like, No. What does that even I, mean? I kind of what does at that even start, mean? People are, also, people like having sex. What's wrong with that? <laughs> we're back to this, I know. Um, but I just also think it's 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 hot like that scene with the three oh, of yeah. them dancing together. That's like, that's a hot scene. That's an all time like hot Maribel scene. Verdu. Oh my oh god! My gosh. Yeah. She's uh, she was recently in the Flash. Um, <laughs> yeah, she plays Barry's mom. But yeah, she's she's amazing. She's actually in the movie that I have at number four. Ooh. What's that? Pan's Labyrinth. Nice segue. And James is the transitions yeah. today. So the this is like. I know this is another fairy tale you could say I have in my film, except this is a dark, evil fairy tale from Guillermo del Toro, with the illusion that it was a child's movie, even though it's rated R. But a lot of parents took their kids to see this movie. We talked about when we did an episode, and they're like, "Oh my god, there is brutal, hardcore violence in this film. What are we in for?" But Guillermo del Toro is one of the best filmmakers alive, and the way he crafts original stories, and when it comes to fairy tales. I can't think of a better original fairy tale in the last 50 years, especially when it comes to cinema and storytelling, than this. Just completely original. His mind and his creativity is unparalleled when it comes to storytelling in cinema. And, you know, this this tells the story of this young girl who, Ophelia, who, you know, whenever I just say her name, I start to tear up because I'm just getting goosebumps already of, of how tragic her story is and you know, the, the theories of is everything made up in her head to cope with the trauma of her day-to-day life and with the backdrop of the Spanish Civil War, which is this is the second film that Guillermo used that at, for one of his storytelling devices. But what he crafted with this sensational horror fairy tale of the loss of innocence, the loss of love, and almost the loss of hope with this young girl and Ophelia, it just kills me every time. The monster designs are incredible. The practical effects sensational. And I adore this movie so much. And 
Very few make movies make me feel the emotions that I feel when I watch Pan's Labyrinth. Great pick, I man. love it. Great pick. <laughs> I love that movie. It's also got a great score. Yeah, great score. Yeah. And uh, uh, Maribel, she plays the um, she plays one of the maids at the uh, yeah. estate. Yeah, when she's with the rebels. Next Someone up, told me. Oh, sorry. Oh go no, ahead. go go for it. <laughs> I, know, I always have so much to say. I, I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> But I was going to say, uh, I watched The Red Shoes the other day. Again, your your recommendation. And someone told me, and I don't know if this is true, that Del Toro added a little nod to The Red Shoes in Pan's Labyrinth. Um, and I don't know if there's any validity to that. I think I would, with- yeah, I would say that it's more of a reference to um, Wizard of Oz. That's what I thought, yeah. Yeah, maybe it could be both. Um, yeah. I, I don't think there's a I mean a specific reference because I mean if you're gonna reference the red shoes it would be the shoes tying themselves. Yeah, I think oh, it's the, that, I think, that would, I think it's that a would Wizard be, of Oz reference. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, Dorothy. Yeah, I, think I think it's more of a Dorothy reference than red shoes. Mm-hmm. But who yeah, knows? Yeah, I, I wanted to ask. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Wow, look at us film bros. We know that this works so well. <laughs> Yeah, there's a couple of film bros and film Man, gals. Isn't that dancing <laughs> sequence unfucking believable in the red shoes? I, My God! Like, what the fact that it came out in the '40s? Like that's what I what I kept thinking. I kept yeah. thinking I'm like, no, no, no. This must be the '60s. This must be the. <laughs> no. What is it? 1946. Some, I think, yeah, mid forties. It's one of the greatest shot things I've ever seen in my life. It's just unbelievable. Absolutely. I held my breath throughout that entire sequence. It's crazy. Yeah. It's fucking crazy. People like there's a thing where like people think that old movies don't look good, but I'm like, dude, the best looking movies ever are old movies. Are you yeah. kidding me? That's true. That's true. Scorsese like, seriously. Oh, well, so Yeah. Yeah. Jeez Louise. They don't oh, man, make I'm, sets like they used to yeah. for sure. I'm glad you like the movie. Yeah. Cause I I mean <laughs> that movie floors me. If it was if this was an American movies list, it'd be up there. <laughs> All right, Anthony, what do you got for number three? All right, at number three I got I got my guy, my guy from Italy, Fellini, at eight and a half. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's his greatest achievement. Uh, another collaboration with his buddy Marcello and Nino Rota's score. The cinematography is incredible, but um, it's uh, it sleeps. It's under the radar for being one of the funniest fucking movies in, of all time. It is so <laughs> hysterical, and I've always found it very funny. But seeing it in a theater with people always makes comedies better. And just being able to laugh out loud with a crowd of 200 people at this movie, it was such a fun experience because the writing and the performances are hysterical. Um, And on top of that, it's also visually stunning and very profound. It has one of my favorite scenes of all time, the the dream sequence where all of his past lovers are basically part of his – his home. And he's such a funny scene. And he's like the (laughs) – he's a a childish version of himself – and then his, his wife is acting as like the maid of every, every in the house, running the house and doing all the work. It's it's an incredible metaphor. The whole the whole movie is just a series of metaphors, and um, it's got probably the most ballsy opening of all time of just silence of him mm-hmm. sitting in a car, and then we get that beautiful shot of him standing on top of the car as it's driving out of the tunnel, um, free, and then him obviously POV flying up in the air tied to a string like. It's the opening of that movie is unparalleled, um, but it's just it's such an enjoyable watch for me because of the entertainment value with the comedy and the story, but then also with the artistic integrity of the film and its visual filmmaking and storytelling is just monumental, um, and I really love it. Brilliant pick. Brilliant, Anthony. <laughs> Excellent. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> If you get a chance to see it in a the theater, you get a yeah, good Yeah, we saw it last week. Yeah. It was, it was an incredible yeah, experience. I was, yeah, I was so jealous. I've only seen it at home, um, but but I love it. I, I, yeah, I, I love that movie so much. It's probably my favorite Fellini. Mm, yeah, it gets better every watch. All right, Marta, number three, what do you got? Number three, uh, my next one is a Bergman pick, and I wrestled with it. I changed it last minute, last <laughs> night. I was going to go with Scenes from a Marriage, but then I was like, wait a minute, there's another Bergman movie that I like rewatching a lot more, and that is Persona. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys have done this, but it makes an excellent double feature with Portrait of a Lady on Fire, uh, to the oh, point where there are some frames. Visual of- references, oh, yeah. yeah. On the beach. Um, so I definitely suggest doing that, or even just checking it out on YouTube. I think someone actually did like a side-by-side. It's, it's, it's really cool. Um, 
But the premise of Persona, we see two women, Elizabeth, a stage actress who has suddenly gone mute, played by Lee Woman. I'm wearing the shirt. Um, and Alma, a nurse who has been tasked to look after her in a remote island setting. Um, and then once they're together, they go through this weird, I don't even know what to call it, like emotional transference. Um, and their personalities start morphing together. What I love about this movie is every single time I watch it, I have a different theory about it. Um, so was Alma imagining Elizabeth to be mute the whole time? Is this going on in her head? Um, and Roger Ebert actually noted a really cool thing in his review on it, that it's called persona, not personas. Um, and then I thought about it more in Latin, persona means mask. So maybe this is Bergman touching on the identity of the masks we put in front of others. I, there's just so much you can pull from this. I think it's a fantastic piece of surrealist cinema, and that is my pick. <laughs> Excellent. And I remember seeing, um, who who made um, Portrait? Was it Celine Sciamma? Is yep. her name? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I remember seeing it in theaters, and that beach scene, I was like, oh, Persona reference. Yes. But also, the story's structured so much like Persona. Obviously, it's lacking surrealism. Um, mm -hmm. It's a more concrete story. Um, it really is about love more than anything. Um, but it's it's it, the comparison is great. That would, you're right. That would make a great double feature. Mm -hmm. They're also just the like the, thematically or not thematically, just the location as well. They're both because in uh, Portrait, they're also on a secluded mm -hmm. beach, aren't they? Or secluded cabin or not cabin? Oh my god, estate, I should say. Yeah, it's just I'm I'm not sure. Is it not an island, like it is in Portrait? Yeah, I mean, but I know it's it's a yeah. secluded estate. I know yeah. that much. Yeah. Great pick. Great pick. Thank you. I, I didn't notice your shirt until now. <laughs> <laughs> the, the computer's so far away. Yeah. What's it say? Uh, Leave Ulman. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Leave Ulman. Yeah. Ulman. <laughs> All right. My number three is Alfonso Cuaron's Itumama Tambien. Hey. I adore this movie so much. And. In addition to everything that Marta already talked about with it, it's one of my favorite just kind of road trip movies mm -hmm. as well as – I love how you brought up The Solitude because when you think about all of Coron's films, The Solitude's there even with Prisoner of Azkaban. I mean with Harry yeah. Potter as the lead character. But um, Itumama Tambien, it's really – I think it might be my favorite coming-of-age movie yeah. because it shows – it's about these two characters. Like you were talking about these two boys. They're best friends, but their social classes are completely different. Mm -hmm. One's upper class, one's middle to lower class. Diego Luna and Gael Gar Garcia Bernal, they're terrific together. The chemistry is magnetic between them. And then um, obviously Maribel Verdu, also f terrific in this movie. But tackling the social issues of not just their relationship and, and how that's involved because – uh, Diego Luna's character, he is just so well off. His father's in the government. He's just incredibly wealthy and privileged. He has a maid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, but Alfonso has that in all of his films as well as specifically with this and then Children of Men. And obviously Roma is – obviously we have a main story that's being told in the foreground of the film. But in the background of every shot, in the background of the story, he's telling a secondary story and a secondary tale – with the social structure and the in the the socio socioeconomics of the world that we're seeing, whether it's Roma, we're seeing the background of that world, and then also with these boys, we're seeing on their journey with the older woman what their country is really like because they're not really exposed to it because they live in Mexico City and they're kind of outside of it. But then they see the real world, the rural aspects of that of the reality of a lot of people who are so impoverished in there with the background narration even the stories of the mm -hmm. person who died on the highway things like that it's so detailed and even the fisherman who loses his job because exactly, of the hotel yeah. and so this movie it's so detailed with things like that as well as hysterical so goddamn funny and just the innocence of youth and the ignorance of youth and how only a couple of short years can change somebody completely and an experience like this changes their lives forever. And I don't want to spoil what happens in the third act, but it's really, as well as being hilarious, incredibly tragic as well. Mm -hmm. But I think yeah. it's a beautiful movie. I adore it. Man, I almost <laughs> put it on my list. Cause I, but I had a feeling you both would put it on your list. So <laughs> I have it in my honorable mentions. And so. if you don't speak Spanish, it also means, and your mother too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're so cultured. <laughs> 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 Shut up. <laughs> All right, next up at my number two pick, I have one that you mentioned earlier, and that's Kobayashi's Harakiri. Yes. Uh, I've seen it three times now, and it's it absolutely floored me. And I think uh, I think that 12 Angry Men 
is the greatest screenplay ever written. I think Harakiri is the second best screenplay ever written. Um, yeah. Because, and like you said, it's different from samurai films of the past, um, most of them, because it portrays the samurai as a flawed uh, individual. And the idea of it being glamorized in movies too often, of being, you know, honorable warriors who always do the right thing. But oftentimes, um, especially during the hard times like this, where there was no need for samurai, um, oftentimes samurais took shady jobs. They were sometimes employed as mercenaries just for the highest bidder um, as a way to make ends meet. So they would just bat fight and kill just for money. Um, so being a samurai was not always an honorable thing like many films portray. And this is a film that definitely portrays that. And and I, I, I love the, the structure of the storytelling. I don't want to spoil it because it's got a great twist um, that you find out at the end of the second act. Um, but it is so incredible. And in, in terms of like the identity of the samurai, speaking to the, the suit of armor... What I think is so powerful is that the suit of armor, I would say, is like a representation of, of each clan's history, and mm. it, it represents their honor. And what's incredible at the film at the film's end is how that suit of armor is interacted with in the story, as a way of showing that it is not honorable, and the, this clan is not an honorable clan of samurai, even though they try to act like they are. Um, but it, it's a beautiful story. It's tragic. Um, and the lead performance is so incredible, um, but it's also got some good humor. But the visuals, man. So you mentioned the fight at the end, which is an all timer, but also the hillside duel is yes. one of the most visually stunning things I've ever seen. So the first time I watched this movie, it's because I I was googling something about samurai because um, I, I I've always found the topic fascinating. And I saw just a couple images from that. The black and white photography with the clouds in the background and the heavy winds on the tall grass. And I was like, what the fuck is this? I gotta see it. And that's actually what motivated to see the that's what motivated me to see the film. Um, because I had seen most of Kurosawa's films, but I hadn't seen most of Kobayashi's films. And I was like, holy shit, this is a, this is like the best samurai movie I've ever seen. I think it is the the ultimate samurai movie because of how honest it is about samurai and how they weren't perfect people. Um, but on top of that, just being one of the greatest things I've ever seen in filmmaking. Yeah, I like how you said it's mm -hmm. like how they lost they lost their honor in a mm -hmm. lot of ways trying to yeah. trick somebody. Basically, the bamboo knife and mm -hmm. the metaphors involved with that is exactly it's the, so dude, good. The, the bamboo sword, oh my god. It's one of, the most, one of the most tragic, brutal scenes I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. mm. Great pick. Yeah, what I love about um, what you just described is we both came to the same conclusion about the suit of armor, but our reasons yeah. were different. And I exactly. love when a movie does that. Um, when there's multiple multiple things you can pull for, that's that's the same thing ultimately. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Like so, spoilers if you haven't seen it. But well, I'll just say like when he takes this, like his objective at the end mm -hmm. is to take that suit of armor to show that this is an an honorable clan, and that's just, like he doesn't care. If, like he's gonna he's gonna die trying. Um, and when he sees it, he's like, I'm going for it. And he all he does is take it off its hold holster. But that's enough to show that this is a symbol for you guys losing your honor. It's just mm -hmm. so brilliant. So brilliant. Terrific. All right, Marta. Number two. We're almost done, guys. Yeah, I know. Uh, so my number number two, this is the one that I was like, well, it's kind of some English. Um, <laughs> it's funny because we were chatting yesterday and you guys said uh, we're going to have to talk about each movie. Very briefly was the word you used or words you used. And I spiraled. <laughs> And I was like, how do I talk about this movie briefly? You can't do it. Um, and that's Hodorowski's The Holy Mountain from oh, 1973, <laughs> um, which is truly, in my opinion, an assault on your senses. So I'm going to try and be quick <laughs> and try my best. But um, we follow the lead character, which is the thief. He represents the tarot card of the fool. He also happens to look like Jesus, um, but he's on a journey towards a red tower um, and his path is super eclectic and I'm not gonna spoil that, but once he gets there, he comes across an alchemist who's played by Hodorowsky himself. Um, and this man introduces him to several people who represent different planets and the negative connotations of each one. And ultimately, as the thief seeks enlightenment, Podorsky asks or challenges the viewer as well. And I'm not going to elaborate on that because I don't want to spoil anything. 
Um, but what I love about this movie is it's just so much fun after a rewatch because I find the first time I watched this, I was so focused on the symbolism and trying to make sense of everything um, that it was exhausting. And I've seen it, I think, maybe like six times now. And after each rewatch, I just have fun. I notice the humor that's injected in this that you kind of miss the first time around. And also just the sheer scope of the production design from the locations to the the set pieces, which are unreal, uh, the costumes. I really think it's visually my favorite movie or one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah. And I um, the production design, the costuming is great. Uh, matte paintings, just like the mm -hmm. old school kind of filmmaking that um, you don't see anymore. And it's so colorful. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just like flamboyant and out of control. And it is it, it is overwhelming the first time you see it. It definitely mm -hmm. is, but it, it's just, it's worth the watch, and it's just the most bonkers thing imaginable. Feast for the Senses. Yeah. I see it on film Twitter a lot, because I run their Twitter account. I see the cinematography you like, talked about of, of mm -hmm. that film quite often, the production design. Have you seen stellar. it? I haven't actually seen it myself. I'm about, I was almost watched it the other night, but then I chose, we should Battle, put it on. I chose Battle Royale instead. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I was going to say, I heard, I heard, like, Jap I heard Japanese people, kids talking, in his room and, and then violence and I was like I bet he's watching Battle Royale almost made my almost made my top 10 how'd you like it? it dude I'll talk about it in my honorable <laughs> mention but I gotta get to my number 2 yes which is La N, another French film commonly nice. mispronounced as La Haine it means hatred La Haine La Haine La N, uh, starring Vincent Castle is a timely film even though it came out in 1995 it's still relevant today it tells the story of these three friends that live in this lower class uh, uh, urban area and they are experiencing a full day of life after a night of violent riots after a friend of theirs from their community a Middle Eastern uh, friend was beaten by police officers he's in custody on life support may pass away and so basically it's about these friends how angry they are with the establishment with the police with the violence they've been experiencing in their suburbs and their areas and how they want to do something they want revenge some of them want to achieve it peacefully, but some of them want an eye for an eye, basically. And if their friend dies in the hospital, then someone, something's bad's going to happen, and they're going to retaliate and basically get revenge against the police for what's happened to their community and their friends. And you know, it takes in account so much, so many thematic elements of racism, of classism, as well as the teenage angst that a lot of people are feeling, especially if they experience something like this in their communities and how the community stands together, but also trying to get control of erratic behavior because one of them finds a gun that was dropped by a police officer by the riots, and now they have one of their weapons that they want to use against them. Uh, Vincent Castle is phenomenal in this movie. I have two movies on my list with him because mm -hmm. Irreversible he's in as well. But he's such a star in this movie. And one of my favorite shots in cinematic history is the mirror shot pushing of the, the fake mirror scene. I'm sure everyone's seen it. If they've never seen the movie, you've seen the shot of he's looking in the mirror, but he's actually looking in camera. It's a great practical effect. You should make a TikTok about that. I should that. make a TikTok. It's a great shot. There's no mirror. They just use a body double. I'm sure everyone's seen it, and he's doing the uh, kind of Travis Bickle sort of reference <laughs> of, you talking to me? You talking to me? Uh, in French, obviously, <laughs> but this movie is, <laughs> it's, it's phenomenal and, uh, so well made, so well acted. The third act tears your heart out. It doesn't end how you think it will end, but it's so relevant today and it's, it's black and white cinematography is terrific and it's, great it's, pick. It's awesome. They also do a lot of the, uh, um, what's it called? Dolly zooms. Yeah, in that that mm -hmm. look fantastic. Yeah, the, yeah. The, and then I also do a, a, a famous. Com, yeah. There's a famous pull focus inside of it as yeah, well. Yeah, it's too. a common motif mm -hmm. in the movie yeah. that they do a phenomenal job with. Line. Great pick. Thanks. Really All right, good pick, yeah. we're on to the final round, everybody. Woo! This is the the Ooh, heavy hitter. Wow. We cruise through this. Our favorite international film of all time. I gotta go with the Bergman. I couldn't get it. I couldn't not get him on the list. Yeah. Uh, but for me, it's an easy one to pick because um, Fanny and Alexander is Ooh. just one of my favorite films in general. I think it's uh, the greatest film ever made, but I, it really is one of my favorite movies to watch. It's become uh, a yearly watch for me at Christmas time, so I've kind of adopted the Swedish culture. They they watch this on Christmas, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> even though it's a pretty dark film. Um, <laughs> But this film, it's it's so creative, it's so inventive, um, it's deep, it's meditative, it tackles a lot of themes, 
about humanity's flaws as well as humanity's strengths. It's a beautiful story. It's an incredible script. The cast is phenomenal. Ingmar Bergman, I think it's this is his magnum opus. Um, he made a, a couple films after this, but this is this is the one I think where everything he learned um, making films for three decades he put into this movie. It's very long. It's over five hours, but it's really worth the watch. But if you don't want to watch the five-hour version, there is a three-hour version you can watch instead. But I recommend mm-hmm. the, the long one because it's about this big family in Uppsala, um, high class. They're very well off, but doesn't mean they're not bad people. Uh, they're full of love and heart and um, tradition and kinship. Um, there's so much warmth in the family, and I, I, I love watching it because – um, it's, it's also kind of um, the deer hunter is reminiscent of it where it opens with this huge celebration of the wedding It's literally like 45 minutes in the movie, but this movie does something similar where you're getting a, a sense for the world and um, Fanny and Alexander are the little kids, but really Alexander is the lead of the movie and we're generally seeing things things through his eyes But when I watch this movie, I really feel like I'm ca- I'm transported into the family um, and I'm like amongst one of the kids and um, but on top of that, what I think that separates this from other Bergman films is it actually it has a, a really incredible uh, villain and antagonist in the bishop, um, who is, an, in my opinion, one of the greatest villains put on film. However, he's never put on anyone's lists or ever men- mentioned in anyone talking about greatest movie villains because not many people um, the last several generations have seen this movie. Um, but it is he is just an all-time movie villain for sure. Um, and the movie tackles intense tragedy, um, intense depression. Um, and you see the the depths to which uh, cruel the depths and cruelties which human beings are capable of, but then the beauty that they're capable of as well. Um, I really adore this film for and it, I'm, I'm it's yearly like it's become a tradition for me to watch this movie during Christmas time. Um, and it just it fills me with a lot of like love for cinema, um, more so than o- only a couple other films do that as well. Like to this extent, it really is just a phenomenal work from possibly the greatest director of all time. Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant pick. Great pick. Yeah, for me, I didn't, I, I didn't see like that I, coming. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna go with uh, Seventh Seal, actually. Almost, but I mean. I just I just love Fanny and Alexander. I love it. Fair. It makes me feel so. Most of the time I watch the movie, I just feel so warm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. My my favorite Brigman change. Like if you guys were to ask me the same question next week for my Brigman pick, it, it'd probably be something different. I just mm-hmm. I <laughs> cannot pick a favorite. I love him so much. Mm-hmm. So my number one is going to come as no surprise. And that is In the Mood for Love. <laughs> hey, great pick. By Wong Kar Wai, yeah. And, I mean, you you said so much that now I'm I'm floundering. What else do I say? Um, but, no, I, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people call him a fetishist of romance. But, in my opinion, he's... Uh, nobody captures unrequited love better than this man. Nobody. And I will, I will stand by that until the day I die. Um, but beyond the story, I mean, you have which is beautiful in itself. You have Christopher Doyle's cinematography, who he works with on all his movies, um, who's just created this crazy world, the colors, the 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 ambiance, the, the costumes as well that you touched upon, the soundtrack. It's all just visual poetry, in my opinion. Um, and he so successfully transports you to a specific time and place. And to me, the reason why it's my favorite movie is you just forget that there's anything around you. And that's that's peak filmmaking to me is when you just forget that the world you live in exists and you are in this film. Um, so that's that's kind of all I have to say because James- Peak fiction. <laughs> peak, peak fiction. Peak fiction. Peak, peak fiction. <laughs> lit, is, <Yeah>. lit AF. <laughs> yeah, we, lo- we love In the Mood for Love in this house. <laughs> so good. It's so Excellent good. pick. Excellent Thank pick. You. I love it. I, mean, I, I wish I dressed like that, man. Those suits are so nice. I know. <laughs> the double-breasted suit, man. The, the double-breasted ties. suit, man. People they, used to dress like that just to go get noodles. Now we're wearing, yeah. like, yoga pants, Lululemons. <laughs> and- <laughs> it just makes you want to stand outside in the rain in the dark and just chain smoke, pretty much. Like, <laughs> and, under, and, and stare at your long-lost love. Under an umbrella. Yes. De- <laughs> depressed about your wife cheating on you. <laughs> <laughs> love the pick. All right. My number one. 
is actually a South Korean film that is getting a re-release, at least in America, I don't know about Canada, in August. So everyone, Ooh. make sure when the tickets go on sale to get your notifications on so that you can get tickets before they sell out. Old Boy, directed yes. by Park Chan-wook. This will come as no surprise to anyone who listens to our show because you all know how much I love Old Boy. This, the story and the concept of this is so fascinating and unique. This is the second film in Park Chan-wook's Revenge trilogy, which starts off with sympathy for Mr. Revenge and then Old Boy and then Lady Vengeance, all thematically connected with the story of revenge. And I love a good revenge movie, obviously. And just this concept of this wayward drunk who gets bailed out from prison by a friend for the who knows how many time and then just gets abducted and kidnapped and he's inside of this room eating dumplings watching the same programs on TV every day of his life for 15 years straight with no explanation no human contact nothing besides someone sliding dumplings in through the door that's all he gets and then one day mysteriously after play fighting in his room you know punching the wall a bunch of times for years, vowing vengeance on whoever does this to him if he ever gets out to find them and kill them, gets released. He has no idea why on the on the roof of a building. He has no idea what he was abducted for or why he was captured and kept in that room for so long. But now he's on a path of revenge to find out who did it and why they did it. And it ties into his past and the connections are so unique and interesting and I won't spoil it, but this movie is one of the most fucked up things you'll ever see when it comes to storylines and plot, as well as one of the most shocking shots ever that involves a pair of scissors. You never look at scissors the same way. Never look at them again. (laughs) But I love it, and it has one of my all-time favorite scenes, the hammer scene. Incredible long take in a hallway. You never look at a hammer the same way again. But I love (laughs) this movie so, so much. And I can't wait to experience it in theaters for the first time in my life in August. Probably see it a couple times. But, yeah, old boy. It's the the juice, man. For me, this is the juice. This is the sauce. Great pick, man. It's in my top ten all time in general. Great pick. Thanks. Yeah. Just waxed some glorious poetic right there. (laughs) <laughs> Parch and Wook's all over these lists. My guy. Yeah. All right, how about Wait. we run through our honorable mentions? We'll just yeah. take a turn and say real quickly yes. some five, six favorite films that we didn't that didn't make the top ten. Okay, I have a Prophet, which is a great French film set in prison. It's I think the ultimate prison film after Shawshank. It's so incredible. Um, Un Prophet is how is the French version of it, but it's an unbelievable coming up story about this young guy who's locked away in prison, and he rises through the ranks of power in the prison. It's just so goddamn good. And then Utamama Tambien I have, and The Mood for Love I have. And then uh, Pedro Almodovar's The Skin I Live In. Yeah, that yes. almost made my top 10. I love that's my top 20. <laughs> it's like the craziest movie ever. It's unbelievable. <laughs> um, there's nothing, there really is nothing like The Skin I Live In. And it's so unpredictable. It's got one of my favorite twists ever in movies. Um, and it's just so fucking great. I, I love that movie. Um, Cinema Paradiso, which you said earlier. Mm-hmm. And then Three Colors Red from the Three Colors trilogy. They're all unbelievable. Um, but Red is so good. It's just amazing characters and incredible dialogue and themes that are tackled in the Red one. Um, I really love it. Um, but the whole trilogy is phenomenal. Definitely check out Blue and White as well. Great picks. All right, Marta, what do you got for your honorable mentions? Me, my honorable mentions, Rashomon, like I said earlier, by Kurosawa. Um, I'm not going to even describe that because we all know it. Uh, Taste of Cherry by Kirstami, whose birthday it was yesterday. So happy birthday to the late Kirstami. Um, Taste of Cherry is great. If you guys haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful, again, portrait of depression and loneliness, like some of the other <laughs> movies on my list, but it's, it's, it's truly a stunning movie. Um, highly recommend it. What else do I have? I have The Vanishing by George Slyzer, nice. the original. Um, I actually do a deep dive on this on my TikTok. It's pinned to my profile, so I will send people that way. Um, Eight and a Half by Fellini. And lastly, this is going to be a huge shock because I usually personally hate musicals, but I have Jacques Demy's <laughs> The Young Girls of Rochefort, which is stunning. It's it's so stunning. And take it from someone who usually doesn't like musicals, this blew me away. Actually, all, all of his movies are, are fantastic. He's my one exception to the rule. So that is all me. Right. 
I'm not a big musical person either, but um, maybe I'll check that out. Definitely. Yeah. Great. I love the picks. All right. My honorable mentions include Battle Royale, which I watched for the first time last mm-hmm. night. I've been meaning to check this out, and it didn't disappoint because it's one of my favorites I've seen in a while. Obviously, it didn't make my top 10 because I've got to, like Anthony says, you got to let things digest and watch mm-hmm. a few times for me personally. Yeah, it was just yesterday. Or, yeah, yeah I just watched it last night, yeah. but it was awesome. It's basically the Hunger Games except before the Hunger yeah, Games. Yeah, except <laughs> okay. in Japan. It's so much more brutal and incredible. It's, it's, yeah. I R-rated highly Hunger recommend Games. It's very Tarantino, too. Yeah. I highly recommend checking yes. it out. It's one, of, it's one of his favorite movies. He actually, yeah. so the girl, the, the girl who plays Go Go. Go Go in Go Go. Yeah, yeah, she's number three. 13. Yeah. Yeah. yeah her, her name's Chiaki. And obviously, I, I think a lot of people, just to say on that real quick, they think that he put Go Go in the character like that because he has like a fetish for like Japanese squirrel girls. It's a reference to this yeah. movie Battle Royale. Same oh thing with God. the wardrobe. Jesus. She basically wears the same outfit. He gets criticized for that, but then every anime movie is about Japanese squirrel girls. <laughs> I don't know, not everyone, but. But anyway, yeah, we yeah we talked about that once upon a time episode that's coming that came out. Yeah, a we talked ago. about three things that he's that he was criticized for once upon a time, but that no one else gets criticized. Every for. movie he comes out with, he gets yeah. destroyed by the uh, journalists. But then we have I have Good Night <laughs> Mommy, which oh, is yeah. an yes. Austrian horror movie about identical twins that uh, something fucked up happens to their mom. And or is it their mom? Fucking crazy! <laughs> it's insane. I, I I highly recommend checking it out. It blew my head. Don't watch the remake. Don't watch Don't the remake. Don't remake. The Naomi it. Watts was just in a remake this past year. I saw a clip and I was like, "Yeah, I'm not watching this." No, don't it watch it. It looks awful. Yeah, yeah. the the original is sensational, terrific. <laughs> um, the piano teacher with with, Anth- with which Anthony talked about earlier, High and Low. Anthony talked about earlier. Gamora, which is an Italian oh, yeah. film yes. about basically these two young kids who grow up in a horrible area. There's a crime syndicate and they try to get the upper hand by stealing weapons from them, and it's fucking crazy uh the skin i live in anthony brought up roma and then city of god nice nah. you have some um underappreciated gems on there i don't hear a lot of people talk about gamora and um good night mommy and i love those both of them. those are really, so Gamora's good awesome oh my god <laughs> yeah, good so night good. mommy blew my hair like that blew me away yeah. that's a great horror movie it's yeah. a great mystery too i highly recommend checking it out wow mm-hmm. we are just some, some cool some cool kids over here. Yeah, a <laughs> bunch of bunch of film bros and yeah. gals. And actually, I'll put everyone's list in the description of this episode on YouTube and Spotify. And How Apple. sweet of you! So, so if anyone wants to check these movies nice. out, we'll have the list in the description. So, if Martha, just email us your list. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, uh, other than that, thank Wait. you so much for joining the show. We'll put a Q and A Q&A also into the Spotify of what your favorite international film is. Yeah. As well. So on Spotify, check out the polls and questions like always. But thanks for coming on the show, Marta. It was so fun to chat with a, a fellow lover of international cinema. Yay. And yeah, everyone check her stuff out. Her her articles, her her uh, TikTok, her letterbox. She's killing it. And you're gonna be starting a podcast sometime soon. Yep, I'm going to start that hopefully in October. Um, I'm doing things very by the book, like I'm trying to get grants and I made like a whole brand package for it. So I'm really trying to, you know, get everything in order before I dive into it instead of just blindly doing it, which mm-hmm. I like don't know. Us. That was- like <laughs> us. <laughs> really? That's what you guys Yeah, we had, we had some cameras and mics. We should have got some grants, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah, I want a grant. grant. <laughs> I want a grant. It's a well-oiled machine. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't start out like that. It used to just be a fucking curtain behind each of us. That was Crazy. It. A bedroom curtain. <laughs> Come a long what? way, but wishing you the best. Do you have a name for it yet? Uh, I do, uh, but it's pending. It's kind of lame. It's McFly's Movie House. It's fine McFly's with me. McFly's Movie House. I love it. Not bad. Not bad. I like it. <laughs> I like but it. yeah, hey. so I'm, I'm hoping to launch in October. Um, I'd love to have you guys come on. We can talk more international films. That would be Hell great. Yeah. We'll Hell be yeah. there. We'll but be thank there. you for having me again. I mean, I've it's greatly flattered to be here. So much fun. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. All right. Well, everyone, thanks for tuning into this episode on our favorite international films again like we said let us know what your favorite international films in the polls dms whatever also become a patron today at patreon.com slash raiders of the lost podcast because we don't have grants we need your support <laughs> so you can become a patron there and support us monthly we really appreciate it and leave those five star reviews on spotify and apple help the show so much so take care everyone see you next time This episode was executive produced by our Chosen One patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, 
Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian Singleton, Tyler McFly, Andrew Hagen. Our chosen one patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Raiders of the Lost podcast is a mirror image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson.